From almost as early as slavery arrived in America, so did the seeds of its abolition. As far back as 1652, the colony of Rhode Island passed a law banning chattel slavery. In 1688, Francis Daniel Pastorius, a Quaker in Pennsylvania, wrote the first known statement condemning slavery in colonial America, forcefully acknowledging the universal rights of all people. It was rejected by the Quaker establishment, but its way of thinking would gain power over time. In the 18th century, colonial legislatures across the continent attempted to enact laws to limit slavery. Legislatures in Massachusetts and Virginia voted to ban the importation of slaves, calling it wicked, cruel, and unnatural. But the British vetoed their decisions. James Edward Oglethorpe, founder of the colony of Georgia, urged his fellow Georgians, if we allow slaves, we act against the very principles by which we associated together, which was to relieve the distresses. Although supporters of slavery were a powerful presence in the founding of the United States, abolitionism was a competing force from day one. Thomas Paine, a writer who helped inspire the revolution, forcefully opposed slavery in an article published in 1775. Paine was a founder of the first American Abolition Society, the Society for the Relief of Free Negroes Unlawfully Held in Bondage, formed just a few weeks later. Benjamin Franklin became the Society's first president in 1784. One of Franklin's final public acts was to petition Congress to abolish slavery. While at the national level, Britain would end up abolishing slavery before the United States, newly won independence freed the former colonies to do what the British wouldn't allow. In 1777, Vermont became the first former colony to prohibit slavery. By 1804, all northern states had passed laws beginning emancipation. At the Constitutional Convention, while agreement could not be found to end slavery, those opposed to slavery ensured that there was no recognition of the concept of a slave anywhere in the document. The Constitution prevented the federal government from banning the transatlantic slave trade until 1808, but with President Jefferson's support, an act prohibiting importation of slaves went into effect on January 1st of that year. In the South, emancipation would not come easy, but there too abolitionism was a force and one that frightened the pro-slavery power structure. Quaker and Moravian activists persuaded many Southern slaveholders, moved by their ideals of the equality of men, to free their slaves. In 1790, only 1% 1 of the Upper South's black population was free but in only 20 years, it jumped to 10%. And religion wasn't the only driver. Many became opposed to slavery because they believed it violated the ideals of capitalism and free markets. By 1830, a majority of Americans opposed slavery, but the how and when were disputed. In 1831, William Lloyd Garrison published the first issue of The Liberator, his weekly newspaper calling for the immediate and complete emancipation of all slaves through nonviolent resistance. Garrison said in a speech, I am a believer in that portion of the Declaration of American Independence in which it is set forth, as among self-evident truths, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hence, I am an abolitionist. Garrison's bravery came at great cost. In the South, bounties were placed on Garrison and his supporters. Even in the North, Garrison's radical stance led to mob violence with calls to lynch him. Nearly all Northern politicians, including Abraham Lincoln, rejected Garrison's call for immediate emancipation as extreme. Yet Garrison's paper would have massive influence. Learning the horrors of Southern slavery brought many to the abolitionist cause. Abolitionists like Frederick Douglass and Lysander Spooner persuasively argued that the Constitution demanded the emancipation of all Americans. Douglass explained, its language is we the people, not we the white people, not even we the citizens, not we the privileged class, not we the high, not we the low, but we the people, Negroes, are people. 
Starting in the 1830s, abolitionists mailed millions of pieces of anti-slavery literature to the South, leading to outrage, and the Underground Railroad developed, continuing for decades with heroes like Harriet Tubman personally taking 13 trips into dangerous territory to smuggle slaves to freedom. With the United States expanding westward, anti-slavery and pro-slavery forces contested if new states would allow or disallow slavery. While Lincoln and more moderate members of his Republican Party didn't believe immediate nationwide emancipation was politically possible, they did support its containment from new states, putting slavery on the path to extinction. Campaigning for president, Lincoln said, I have always hated slavery, I think as much as any abolitionist. If we cannot give freedom to every creature, let us do nothing that will impose slavery upon any other creature. Let us discard all this quibbling about this man and the other man, this race and that race and the other race being inferior, and therefore they must be placed in an inferior position. Let us discard all these things and unite as one people throughout this land until we shall once more stand up declaring that all men are created equal. Upon Lincoln's election, fearing the threat to slavery he posed, starting with South Carolina, the southern states seceded, forming the Confederate States of America. At the start of the war, Lincoln claimed he had no plans to abolish slavery in the South and that his goal was simply to maintain the Union. But that quickly changed. On the eve of the Civil War, four million black Americans, 13% of the total population, were enslaved. But on January 1st, 1863, that all began to crumble when Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation went into effect, freeing enslaved people in the Union-occupied Confederate states. More than 365,000 Americans, both black and white, gave their lives fighting for the Union Army. Their efforts allowed the last of the Confederacy's 3.5 million slaves to be freed on June 19, 1865. However, slavery persisted in Delaware, Kentucky, and even in New Jersey, 16 slaves remained in bondage. Lincoln ran his 1864 re-election campaign on the platform of fully abolishing slavery across the nation, and he did just that. On January 31, 1865, the 13th Amendment passed in the House of Representatives by a vote of 119 to 56. The House exploded in celebration. Less than three months later, Lincoln was murdered. But thanks to his work and those of all the abolitionists who paved the way, the 13th Amendment was ratified December 6, 1865, ordering that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Today, in America, we celebrate these historic accomplishments through holidays like Juneteenth. Heroes like Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and Abraham Lincoln have been encoded into the American narrative. Internationally, the Republic of Togo even put Lincoln on a stamp, memorializing his Emancipation Proclamation. The end of slavery would not represent the arrival of justice and equality for the former slaves. There would be a long road with much to be done but the destruction of an evil institution that had plagued humanity for millennia was a moment of unprecedented progress. Learn more about the stories that define and unite us at fairstory.org.